excellent night, that you rested well, that you were up early this morning and already went for your run to get ready for your big race tonight. Uh, I understand the competition is going to be very, very keen, and so you, you better be at your best when you get there tonight. I, I was thinking when uh, Russ made his announcement, he couldn't really enjoy the morning because the mountains kept getting in the way. When we were when we're driving out here uh, yesterday, just as we got to about where the first big mountain was, there was a car pulled over to the side, and a fellow was out standing there taking a picture of this mountain. And I won't tell you where the license plate on the car was from, but I just suspect that it's the first mountain he'd ever seen. And I just you know, really had to capture that. And so, you know, I'm not sure what you were driving, Russ, but uh, it, it might have might have been that. Well, you know, yesterday we talked about knowing what you're running for. Today I want to talk with you about knowing what you're running from. And that actually is just a fancy way of saying that what I want to talk with you this morning, I want to talk with you about sin. And I didn't announce that because uh, that's not a title that's very good for attendance. <laughs> and I didn't want anybody skipping this morning. So while it's not really a favorite topic, it is a critical topic for growth. We need to understand the truth and the whole truth about sin. A while back, I was driving through the parking lot of a shopping center in Kelowna when something occurred that had never happened to me before. I was actually driving my son's sporty car, and so I guess they thought I was younger than I really was. And a couple guys driving towards me in an older van, they flagged me down, and they said, I rolled, put the window down, and he said, hey, mister, we've got two brand new home theater units. They're worth about $7,000 each. We'll sell them to you for $1,500 each. Are you interested? I said, of course I'm interested. Who wouldn't be? Pull over in the corner away from the crowd. Now, what you may not know about me is that I spent more than a decade as an auxiliary member of the RCMP. And uh, I figured, like, here's an arrest just waiting to happen. And I still had the personal cell numbers of a couple of cops in my phone. So while we're heading over to the corner of this parking lot, I, I tried to get one of these uh, members on, on the phone. Nobody answered their phone. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't believe this. I got two guys red-handed, obviously selling stolen property, and nobody answers their phone. So by the time I get over to the corner of the parking lot, these guys are waiting there for me. So I get out and they show me in their side of their van, open the doors, brand new units right in the boxes. And I had a decision to make. You know, I wanted to catch them, but now I was on my own as a, as a civilian. And so I'm thinking just furiously. And so I did what any good husband would do. I said, you know what? I'm very interested in these, but I can't buy them without talking to my wife first. So I just, you know, I just need a little more time here. And so I walked back around on the other side of my car, and this time I phoned the police station. And I asked for the watch commander. They put me right through, and it was a guy that I used to work with years ago. Would you know what? He's away from his desk on another situation. I get put on hold. Now I'm standing there in the parking lot with this stuff, and I, I got this real dilemma, like to buy or not to buy. That's the question. And so I walk back over to the guy slowly, and again, my mind's just racing. I said, sorry, boys. I said, no deal. And one of them said to me, you've got to be kidding. I says, hey, are you married? And he says, sort of. And I said, well, then you know how it is. You know, I said, I I'm not going to cross my wife. And he, he just looked me right in the eye, and disgustedly, he says, she probably thinks they're hot. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what would ever give her that impression, you know. So not to bore you with any details, I filed a complaint the normal way, giving a description, license number, and all the rest of this. And then I texted one of the original cops that I tried to call, but this time she's at her phone. She texts me back immediately. She says, hey, Tim, you do remember there's a number called 911? And uh, about 20 minutes later, she called me. And she had uh, run the license plate. She checked on these bad guys. And they'd already had a complaint about them and had done a full checkup on them. Can you believe it? The stuff wasn't stolen. It might not have been worth $7,000 each, but it wasn't hot. I could have had a beautiful home entertainment system, second to none. I could have watched the Maple Leafs lose in 72 inch high definition. And there I just, like, I just missed it because I didn't catch what was going on. I wasn't just passing time with that story. Believe it or not, it does you know, have a point. How many times do you find yourself wondering about well, some situation you're encountering, whether you're getting the whole story? Whether you're really getting not just the truth, but the 
whole truth. Are you seeing the fullness of what the event is? I mean, we live in such a made up world. Just think of some of the words, and some are dated and some are more common. Lip sync, counterfeit, knockoffs, posers, clones. You know, at one point, those were rare. Today, they apply to just about everything from the jeans we wear, the phones we talk on, the computers we use, even the diamonds we give to profess our love. We become so accustomed to political correctness and airbrushing the truth that the whole truth and nothing but the truth typically causes us extreme discomfort. We rather leave rather sheepishly just accept the indictment of that famous movie line, you can't handle the truth, as being an unfortunate but very accurate commentary on our day. And yet with all this dodging and coloring of the truth, I've discovered, and I think you would share that discovery, that there has never been an era where there is more deeper craving for truth than there is today. People are starved. Will you just give me the straight goods? Will you tell me what I'm up against? Will you tell me what's really going on? We long for the truth. And so I just want to ask you the question that all this has been leading up to. How acquainted are you with the truth about sin? How complete is your understanding of what it is that we are running from? We know what we're running for. How complete is our understanding of what we're running from? Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, as was read for us. I want to suggest to you that there is a way of thinking about sin that can actually move us toward God. Now, let's be clear. There's some ways of thinking about sin that have the opposite effect. They drive us away from God, and we're going to have a look at some of those this morning. But there's a way of thinking about sin that can move us toward God. And wouldn't it be something if that happened? As I was thinking about these days, uh, every once in a while, I, keep, I always have the end in mind with myself. And I say, so what would success look like this weekend? You know, you know what success for me would look like? If you went back to wherever it is you've come from and say, you know what? I think I took a step toward the Father this weekend. I think I took a step toward his heart. Like, wouldn't that be something? Well, Mark chapter 7, we find here another confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. On the one side, and you heard it as it was read, on the one side, according to the religious leaders, Jesus and his followers were sinning. They were neglecting some of the traditions of the law. However, on the other side, according to Jesus, the religious leaders had allowed their traditions to actually take the place of a real heart for God. And the very practices that had been put in place to show love for God were now practices that were actually getting in the way and moving people away from the Father which incidentally, from my perspective, is a pretty good definition of sin. Anything that moves us away from the Father is sin. And so in typical Jesus fashion, he doesn't skirt the issue, he doesn't avoid it, he just faces it head on, and he gives us in this text a brand new way of thinking about sin. And it's a way that can move us toward the Father. And once again, I just can't help but wonder, wouldn't that be something if that happened to us this weekend? But moving towards the Father, I think you all get this, doesn't happen accidentally. Doesn't happen just by itself. One thing I learned early on as a runner is that there are very few surprises come race day. At least not good surprises. Almost everything that happens is a direct result of training. And we know that. We know that in every other area of our life. I just want to make sure this morning we get it spiritually. A step away from sin and toward God is an intentional, involved process. And so we're going to work at it. We're going to dig into the text and see what Jesus has to say about it. And, and then we're going to take what he says about sin and moving towards the Father. And we're going to examine our own hearts in light of it. Deal? That's where we're heading. Let's go. Mark chapter 7. Part of this process of running from sin and towards the Father. Here's the first thing I think we need to understand. I think we need to face the limitation of a religious mindset. The limitation of a religious outlook, a, a religious perspective. I just hunker down because we're going to fly the next couple of minutes because this text is just packed with some challenging and incredible information. First, we'll read the first part of it again, verses 1 to 8. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. 
And the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, get this, this is how you win friends and influence people. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Boy, that's a mouthful. Let me try to explain what's going on here and why Jesus reacted so strongly to what on the surface seemed like a very innocuous question. Hey, how come your boys don't wash before they eat? It's not a bad question. But Jesus took it pretty severely. So let's take a look at what's going on. First, this passage is about something that scholars refer to as boundary markers. At initial glance, boundary markers were not bad things. So here, here's how they work. God would give a law, and the people would be so respectful of this law that instead of just keeping the law, they say, we don't even want to get close to breaking that law, so we're going to build a fence around that law so that we don't even get close to it. Not a bad idea. And so next group would come and they'd take a look at that and say, you know what, we think you're on the right track. But that fence is a little too close to the law. And so we're going to build a fence around the fence around the law so that we're not going to take a chance of breaking that law or getting too close to breaking it. Another group would come along, typically another denomination, and they'd take a look at this and say, you know, you guys are you're sort of on the right track here. Well, we think you're too close. So they build a fence around the fence around the fence around the law, and it starts coming back, and you can see clearly what's going to happen. Pretty soon, some poor sucker is going to be climbing over the 16th fence, and they're going to get shot for breaking the law. It's particularly common. You, you guys are students of the Bible. It's particularly common with the Sabbath laws, but purity laws like this, like the ceremonial washing. It was right up there, and, and they did it a lot. Now, don't get too self-righteous about this. We all do it. We all build fences. I, I know I do. I, I do with vehicles. I, I got a thing for vehicles. I like vehicles. One of my absolute intolerables in life are door dings. Somebody bangs my vehicle with their door. I got to consciously remind myself to breathe. And so I build a fence. And I expect my family to build fences. They, they, don't just get in they don't just get a sermon from me if they come home and there's a door ding on the car. They get a sermon from me if I ever see them park somewhere where they might get a door ding. Like you go park in the far corner, you know, where nobody is going to ding your vehicle. And don't laugh at me. You know, I've, I've, I've been in homes. I've not been in any of your homes, but I've been in homes where you know what I see? I see where they have put rugs on top of the carpet. <laughs> You know, I mean, heaven forbid that somebody actually walk on a carpet that's designed to be walked on. So you you got to keep, we're, we're great at building fences, boundary markers. The problem is we're really good at it spiritually too. And these boundary markers tend to lead to an even bigger challenge, and the bigger challenge is legalism. And simply defined, legalism is when adherence to the fences becomes the criteria by which we judge people. You see it in the text? How come your disciples don't wash? And you know what the implication is? Like we do. Like we do. They don't quite say it that openly, but it's there. And, and this adherence to the fences and the boundary markers, it starts to lead to comparison with others, which leads to spiritual arrogance, which leads ultimately to exclusion of people that don't keep the same fences that we do. And so you start seeing where legalism is involved, that people are not embraced because they are loved by the Father. They are included or excluded by the way they respect the fences. That's legalism. It's the ugly truth about it. And now it really starts to heat up in the text because there is a reason Jesus is calling them on this because immediately after this encounter, Jesus meets and he performs he healing miracles. Are you ready for this? For two Gentiles. Two outsiders, people who don't even know fences exist, let alone respect them. 
There's a Syrophoenician woman in verse 24, and there's a Greek man who was deaf in verse 31. And all of a sudden, this discussion about what's clean and what is unclean is no longer theoretical, and it's no longer about hands, and it's no longer about pots and pans. What it's really all about, and it's always all about, is people. And one more time, Jesus lets them know that you can't exclude people because of some fences you've built. Now, just one more observation from this part of the text before we move on, and, and this one I have to clarify. And I don't know if, if those of you who are in pastoral ministry or, uh, you know, if, if you ever do this, but sometimes I come across an idea in Scripture that I think is true, but I don't know for sure. And so this is one of those, and I'll comment on something I say, I think this is true. I know the principle is true. I'm not sure that it, it's right from this text. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Mark if this is what he meant by this. But I think it's probably true. But here's the principle. Misguided religion not only causes us, first of all, to build fences and then to exclude people on the basis of those fences, legalism, but this misguided perspective of, of religion, it also causes us to miss blessings, to miss the blessings of God. I don't think anybody will dispute that. It's hard to enjoy the sunset if you're worried that you're too close to the fence. So just take a look at, the, at this text, and I think this is what it's teaching. In, in verse 2, the religious leaders saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. Now that's a pretty good translation of the original, but it misses something because what the literal translation is, it says they were eating loaves with hands that were defiled. You say, okay, food, loaves, what, what, what's the difference? The, the difference is that if you glance just a couple paragraphs earlier, you'll discover that the event that immediately precedes this was the feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus, where he took the five loaves and the two fish and he fed all of those crowds. And in chapter 6, verse 43, the disciples had just picked up how many baskets? 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And then you got this key word in Mark that we talked about last night. Then immediately, so you got this miracle, and immediately they get in the boat, they head over to the other side, at which point the Pharisees see the disciples eating loaves. My point is, that most likely what's going on here is that the boys are having a celebration picnic with the leftovers of the most famous miracle in history, and the religious leaders are hung up on the fact that they didn't wash their hands first. And can't you just imagine Peter and John, and you're there, and, and John, you know, tosses a loaf over to Peter, and Peter says, hey, you got any peanut butter to go with this? And they're back for saying, do you guys see all of this food? And they say, did you see? It was just these few loaves and, and some fish. Did you see what Jesus did with this? And they're having this great celebration of what Jesus had done. And the Pharisees are there saying, they didn't wash. And how often it happens, they missed the whole blessing of God because they were hung up on a stupid fence. And how often it happens. Instead of the loving heart of God, we build a bunch of fences which we then legalistically apply to criticize others and to segregate ourselves from them. And then we miss the extravagant blessing of God even when it's right in front of us. What a loss. Both the time I started in pastoral ministry, there was a story making the rounds. And now, you know, so I'm, I'm almost into my fourth decade and this, this story was way back and it's just sort of kept going and nobody ever knows if it was true or not, but we, most of us my age heard it and we've told it numerous times. But it was about your typical worship service in a typical church, just like ours. And, and you know exactly how church services were 35 to 40 years ago, everything rigid, everything tight. And they're just getting ready to start and the service was just beginning and our church services always started with the singing of the doxology. That's how Baptists started every service back then. And they were just ready, just singing the doxology. And in came a young man, long hair, beads, vest with no shirt, jeans and no shoes. He walked right down the middle and he sat down cross-legged on the floor right down in the front. Back in the 70s when that story was coming around, we even had a name for those guys. We called them hippies. He comes in, he sits right down there, and that story had a real possibility. And no sooner had he sat down than the chairman of the deacons stood up, and he walked right down the aisle. He came marching right down the aisle. His three-piece suit was perfectly pressed. His silver hair shone as brightly as his shoes. And he says, the whole church just went, it's going to happen now. This is going to be something. And the chairman got right down to the front 
right beside this hippie seated on the floor. And he looked at him and he loosened his thigh and he kicked off his shoes and he sat down cross-legged on the floor beside him and they proceeded to worship God together. How much would the kingdom have lost that day if there had been a different response? How much would the kingdom have been set back if he had turned to that young man and said, young man, in this church, in this church, we respect God. We wear ties and shoes. We sit properly. You come back when you're ready to respect the fences. But everybody moved towards the heart of God that day. But what does your young man look like today? I was recently asked to do an endorsement on a book on the parables. And the author portrayed the Good Samaritan. You sort of wondered, like, they portrayed the Good Samaritan as a transgendered subway passenger from New York City. Pushed my buttons, I'll tell you. And that's just an example. That's not an agenda with me. That's just an example of her trying to say, like, how would they be viewing the Samaritan in that day? If you're online in, in the last couple of weeks, uh, those, those of you especially from Central and, and Atlantic Canada, you know the story that's been really trending about the cop from Halifax? You see in the picture? And there's the homeless guy, and here's the motorcycle cop with his boots and his uniform, and he's sitting sprawled out on the sidewalk having conversation with, with this homeless guy on the street in Halifax, and, and it's just gone viral everywhere. And they're saying, like, that's connection? I think, you know what that is? That's kingdom. That's kingdom. In which you're able to say, life isn't about a fence. Anything that causes you to compare yourself with others and make yourself better than others and lead to exclusion and condemnation, anything that's causing you to miss the blessing because you're too uptight about the fences, that's this religious mindset that a lot of us grew up with that Jesus said isn't what God the Father was about in the first place. So I think the first part is sort of exploding this and getting close to God's heart is saying, I got to I got to figure out when stuff is just fences for me. When it's just needless boundaries and really doesn't have much to do with the father's heart. I got to start to make that distinction. OK, I issue number two, I think if we're going to really get the truth about sin. We need to address the deceitfulness of appearance, the deceitfulness of appearance. Jesus turns up the heat now in verse nine. He continued, you've got a fine way of setting aside the, set aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And he says, and you do lots of things like that. I don't know how many of you are really up on your understanding of Corbin. I asked a number of people around our church what they knew about Corbin. I got three blank stares and then one asked the question, didn't he used to play for the Montreal Canadiens? <laughs> <laughs> Corbin was an oath that would dedicate something for temple use. And so the way this would typically work is that somebody might say, you know, all of the prophets from this particular field, I'm going to declare as Corbin. I'm going to give it to the temple. It wasn't required. It just made people look really good. And of course, the religious leaders really liked Corbin. They really liked Corbin because they were getting these extra bonuses until Jesus challenged it. He cited Old Testament laws about how we're to view our parents. Well, these laws were never, to my knowledge, fully enforced where someone who cursed parents was actually stoned. But adult uh, children were fully expected to care for their elderly parents in times of need. Remember, there was no old age security. There were no pension plans. The family farm or the family business, that was the pension. And so as the younger generation would take over, they would use that to take care of the older generation. But here's what's going on. You've got mom and dad in need. They're not being supported. And the adult children would say, hey, hey dad, love to help you, but I can't because I've declared this Corbin. Can't give it to you. I've got to give it to the priests. Now, several commentators suggest that although this text doesn't explicitly say so, between the lines, it's hinted that there'd been a bit of a deal worked out between these guys and, and the priests, where maybe not all of the prophets went to the priests. They just pretended to give it all. You know that famous story in Acts. We sold the field, and how much did you give? No, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And they kept some back, and they still didn't take care of their parents. 
And Jesus exploded. He says, you got all this great appearance of stuff. But he said, on the inside, it stinks. And he says, you know what? You do a lot of stuff like that. That's just an example. If you want to take a step toward the heart of God, one of the first issues you're going to have to address is the issue of appearances. And I think, and I love that there's, you know, many of you here, I think the generation about 30 years of age and under has done us a great favor because for the most part, the younger generation is just repulsed by appearance. By and large, they don't care what anything looks like, only whether or not it's the real deal. A dozen or more years ago, I was in what I considered to be the best shape of my life. I had run my fastest marathon in June, and I would continued to train for the Toronto Marathon in October. And I was pumped, and I was ready to go. And then the day before the marathon, I was all alone at an airport hotel in Toronto. I got sick. And I'm thinking, oh man, you're here, I'm thousands of kilometers away from home to run this marathon. And uh, you know, I can't eat, I can't carbo load properly. And I managed to get up and go downtown and pick up my race kit. And I came back and I still couldn't eat. So I thought, you know, I'm going to put my shoes on and go for, I'm going to prove this one way or another. I'm just going to go for a little two or three K run. And I almost crawled back to the hotel and to make a long story short. Um, by that evening, I was in the back of an ambulance, and by midnight, I was on the operating table, and they hauled out what they called a hot appendix. And I, I played it up a lot and got a lot of sympathy, but in fact, you know, that's a, that's a pretty routine, uh, you know, uh, procedure. But the sobering part for me is I've had, you know, reflected on that one. I look good, if I have to say so myself. <laughs> Body fat percentage was the lowest it had been since Arlene had married me. I thought I was in great shape, best shape of my life. But there was poison on the inside. There was stuff going on inside that you couldn't see. It's the deceitfulness of appearances. And this isn't in the Bible, so you can just write this off as one of Tim's quirky sayings, but it's one of the few things that I'll say that's probably worth writing down. Unless I'm mistaken, it is almost impossible to move toward the heart of God if you're worried about what the move looks like to others. It's almost impossible to move toward the heart of God if you're worried about what the move looks like to others. So if you want a really rewarding but challenging exercise this weekend, pray the prayer of the psalmist. Search me, O God. Search me, know my heart. Lord, will you show me where I'm more concerned with appearances than I am with your own heart? When you get really serious about that, you move the right way. You'll move the right way, no doubt about it. All right, the third issue. We're going to gain a new way of, of thinking about sin and move towards the Father. We need to understand the direction of a stain. The direction of a stain. Now, I'm be full credit here. That's a phrase that I've stolen directly from Timothy Keller. But he does such a, a great job with it. Let me just see if I can communicate it well. Verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him, and he said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside you can defile you by going into you. Rather, it's what comes out of you that defiles you. That's the climax of the whole text. Stop and think about it. The reason we build fences, the reason we exaggerate laws, the reason we try to do things that make us look better than we really are is our attempt at what Keller calls outside-in cleansing. We're not going to let anything out there close to us, anything out there, defile us. And so maybe we can build enough fences to keep sin away from us. Maybe we can do enough good things to make up for anything bad. Maybe we can engage in enough self-improvement initiatives to clean ourselves up. And from the beginning of time, we have tried and tried and tried. Let's make it, us look good from the outside. Keep evil away from us. And now Jesus, the only spotless one, calls our bluff on it. He says, hey guys, there is no use trying to limit the stains around you because the truth is, the truth is the stain is within you. 
And it keeps showing up, he says, all the time, verse 21, from evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside you and defile you. And so what's needed is not better fences. What's needed is not more attempts to appear good. What's needed is an inside-out cleansing possible only by the sacrifice prepared by God himself and his precious lamb called Jesus Christ. I find myself badly outnumbered in our family these days. In our immediate family, there are three in the medical field and the fourth is a science teacher. And then there's me, preacher. Mr. Sociology, Criminology, Theology. And recently, we're family was all together at home and I found myself listening to them and I couldn't understand a word. They're all talking science, they're all talking medicine, I had no clue what was going on except all of a sudden they got to one topic and my ears perked up. There is a study out, in fact there are several studies corroborating it now, that suggest that we keep our kids far too clean for their own good. It says they're not exposed to enough dirt and germs when they're young. Some of you think I'm making this up, aren't you? you know? Kids who have siblings who interact a lot with other kids who grow up on a farm or come in frequent contact with cattle, poultry, cats, and stuff, who experience such They have fewer issues with allergy and things like asthma when they grow up. Well, kids from very small, clean families with extremely hygienic conditions are more likely to develop these problems. You know what they're discovering? They're discovering that as we raise our kids, it's more about what happens inside than keeping them from stuff on the outside. It's about the development of a healthy immune system, more so than staying away from a little bit of external contamination. And I listened to that conversation and then they moved on to more scientific data that I couldn't understand and I just sort of pulled back and went into my own little world and said, that's exactly what's going on spiritually. So many of us have spent our whole lives afraid of spiritual contamination from the outside. And certainly not in this group, but in many Christian groups that I'm in, you just listen to the topics of discussion in any coffee circles about how evil this world is. How can anybody ever love God in this evil times that we live? And there's this that's wrong and that's that's wrong and everything. Else. And we're all talking about what's going on out there. Jesus said, don't worry so much about what's going on out there. He says, what you want to be addressing is what's going on in here. Because the direction of the stain is not this way. The direction of the stain is what's coming from the inside out. A couple of thousand years ago, Jesus pointed out the futility of outside in cleansing. And he invited us all to focus on the only cleansing that is actually effective. And that is the internal washing by the blood of Jesus Christ that says though your sins were red like crimson they can be white as snow the cleansing of his forgiveness and so in this race of ministry I want to just nudge us towards the father's heart today by saying let's not worry too much about the limitations of religion and boundary markers and legalism and comparisons and all that and deceitfulness of appearances let's embrace the one who deals with the real issue who cleanses us from the inside out. And as we embrace the cleansing flow of Jesus Christ, our ministry is going to change. And we'll start from the perspective of grace that has made us clean, and we will invite people in to that good news of what he's able to accomplish. Thank you again this morning. God bless you as you deliberate through this day and share together in the fellowship of this great conference.